You're listening to Fit Pro Sessions with Parallel Coaching, episode number 28. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman, and in today's podcast, myself and Haley explore the Fit Pro Guide to Bones. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman. And I'm Haley Bergman. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands of fitness professionals to get qualified, learn with simplicity, and coach clients with confidence. We're the first to say that learning and being a fit pro doesn't have to be hard work and that with the right structure, support and resources, you can become a confident and knowledgeable fitness professional that is dedicated to more. So how do you learn, qualify and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. Fit pros often see the skeleton as something that they need to know just for the anatomy exam. And then as soon as your exam is over or their exam is over, poof, all the information just disappears. Now I'm going to say it's not just the skeletal system or skeleton of the bones. I'm going to say it's all eight modules. All of them. (laughs) And that's a big claim. That's not for every fit pro out there by any means. But quite a few. Yeah, and I'll be honest, I I maybe thought that. that as well. To be honest, yeah. many moons ago. That feeling of like, just I only need to know this knowledge for the exam, and then after that, I can just forget it. Yeah, I mean, I qualified back in like the mid two thousands with you, and the emphasis then was was on yeah, it seems ages ago, doesn't it? <laughs> Fifteen years ago plus. <laughs> um, the emphasis then was all on the exam. Yeah. And that this knowledge, this manual, um, which seemed to be thicker than it is now, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, it was, a um, was was just for the exam. There was very little um, emphasis on why this knowledge was important beyond the exam. Yeah, and I think that has another problem with it because if you don't know, if you don't think you need to know it, then you don't kind of hold on to that information. If you don't know the bones of the body, then it's tricky to learn things like the origin insertion, the muscles, it's got- Energy systems or the heart and lungs, whatever it is, but it sits in your short-term memory. Mm. okay so i'm actually learning at the moment i won't go into the ins and outs um, and i have an exam in a month's time yeah and i understand why i need this information beyond the exam so it's not a case of learning it for my short-term memory so i can recall bits of information based like on trivia. An, yeah yeah it's not a pub <laughs> quiz <laughs> um, i wish it was it would probably be easier <laughs> I know. Pub quizzes are hard. they are actually you yeah. don't want me on your team for a pub quiz. so the point being like it sits in your short-term memory. Yeah. Whereas if you're learning it beyond that for the exam, you're giving yourself a chance for it to kind of sit in and, and move into and your life. And actually lot, learn and, it. And actually learn it. So I retain it. And part of learning is then applying it, isn't it? So you can learn it, you can apply it. Whereas if it's just in your short-term memory and you don't ever apply it to something you go and do, then that doesn't necessarily sit well. Well, so, if that knowledge sits there in a the short-term memory and it's just something that you're doing for the exam, once the exam is over, your short-term memory no longer has to hold that information. Yeah. yeah because it's, it because it, it ha- it, it's allowed to disappear because it's served its purpose. I'll explain why a lot of people say that I can't get it to stick in my head. Whereas if you're learning it for your long-term memory, so six months or a year down the line or five years down the line, or for, for, for me, 15 years down the line, <laughs> um, and I'm passing that on to a client. Yeah, I've got to I've got to give my myself a, a a break and a chance really to learn that information, and not just for one forty minute exam or yeah. one hour exam, whatever it might be. Absolutely, and I think with all of this in all parts of anatomy, but especially with the skeletal system, it creates a cascade effect beyond what people probably. Um, anticipate so the cascade effect here is that if you don't know the bones of the body and it then it becomes tricky to learn like the origin and insertion of the muscle so when we say bones we're not just saying um the skeletal system like that's for humerus is that what you're talking about or the yeah. types of bones the types of bones and the names of the bones okay as location well. okay then then you don't know it's hard to learn the origin and insertions and if you don't know the origin and insertions of the muscle then it's hard to understand the muscle actions yeah And if you don't know the muscle actions, you don't know which muscles are worked on which exercises. And what those muscles are. So not just uh, origins and insertions of the muscle actions, but the actual what do those, what's in the muscle. So for example, the epi, peri, the the actual structure of the muscle. muscle. And then if you don't know that, in terms of knowing which muscles are worked on which exercises, you're basically guessing when it comes to planning. Which cascades, I'm going to take it further into energy systems, because yeah. that's obviously where the, the mitochondria is, the storage, ATP, XYZ. So it, it, it cascades, and therefore you're talking about circulation. 
and yeah. they're talking about um, the heart and lungs. So yeah. all eight modules, whether you're level two A and P, level three A and P, they they cascade. And they're so intertwined. It's what not is like module, one what, starts. Well, module one is heart and lungs, but <laughs> yeah, I think that's the, for me that's the biggest cascade effect. Yeah. But if you open up your manual, it doesn't matter whether you're with Active IQ, YMCA, VTCT, um, all of the other major award, transcend awards. The likelihood is I'm going to put my money on it. The first four to six pages are bones. Talks about the bones. Talks about the bones, the skeletal system, and that's the start of your journey. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Agree with that one. Yeah. Totally. Cool. So if we understand that, we can then move into all of the other modules elegantly and go. Okay, that links to this. This links to that. X, Y, and Z. And you can apply that as a coach, yeah. as a fit pro. So if you've got all this knowledge, in particular the skeletal system we're talking about today and bones, but how you then, adva- it will advance you as a fit pro and a coach. And that yes. generally people would find really distracted from each other, really different. What I learn about bones and I get better as a coach. Like, what it's are you hard, all about? <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Um, and, and you know, I think the biggest thing I hear a lot from learners is they turn around and go, well, my client will never want to know this information. <laughs> You're right. They <laughs> won't want to know this <laughs> information. Know. You know, you could put out, uh, on a pub quiz trivia, there are 206 bones in the human body, or there are five different types of bones, or your elbow is a hinge joint. Yeah, but they, you know, that's a pub quiz, but they don't need or want to know necessarily about the skeletal system or the types of bones or any of the A and P for that matter. It's you, the fit pro, me, the fit pro, that needs to know it. And know about the body. And know about the body in order to plan effectively to take somebody from a to b which is physiological adaptation of the body of the body (laughs) 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 so knowing the bones and skeleton system or skeletal system will allow you to know exactly what the body should look like as well when you're observing your client so if you think when you go around you're looking at posture you're looking at technique in your client how do you know what is right or wrong if you don't know what the skeletal system is and how that is structured? Completely. So in your book, in your manual, and in the Revision Mastery Bootcamp, all the imagery is in this anatomical position. Yeah. So if I stand, if you stand up now, do do it, in fact, you know, uh, as you're listening to us, stand up now, toes tracking forwards, kind of your hips tracking forwards as well as if you've got headlights on the hips, and then have your palms facing forwards. Yeah. Okay, that would be the anatomical position. So you've got the anterior view of the skeletal system and the posterior view if I stood behind. Exactly. And now you can see if I was in a true anatomical position, I now know what the skeletal system must look like in relation to being anatomically true. Yeah. And now if I walk around my client on a... uh, body MOT or the the first of their few sessions or the beginning of every session, you can see where is their skeletal system in time and space. And we've used this analogy before of this human x-ray machine of literally looking at your client whilst you're walking around them and viewing them, but seeing those bones and and the positioning and the posture and the technique and how everything's aligned, that will help. Completely. And as we jump into some principles now, we'll understand what's actually going on in a skeletal system and how the muscles are pulling on these bones and pulling us into all different types of positions and why we must know it even more. Let's do that. Let's go for it. Tell so, me about bones. Bones. Uh, where do you want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> you. I'm going to throw it over to you. I think we need some. Believe it or not, of... Mrs. Plant. <laughs> I think we need some sort of overview to start off with so we kind of know exactly what we're talking about especially if this is the first time you've come across learning the skeletal system, but bones and the skeletal system as a whole. The skeletal system. Skeletal system. The skeletal, the skeletal. Uh, <laughs> provide the structure for our body. So they create the shape and the structure. Um, and it's made up of how many bones? 206, which I've already mentioned. Okay. Yeah, that yeah. could be a typical level two A and P question. They might actually. come up actually, yeah. Not, not for me to suggest that one. Um, but when we're talking about the... The bones, the majority of those bones are actually found in our hands and feet. Yeah. Okay. Um, outside of that, obviously, you've got your, your, your skull, your spine, the vertebra, the ribs, the arms, the legs. Okay. So if you just take the leg, for example, you know, you've got your femur. Yeah. And then you've got in your lower leg, Haley, what have we got? Uh, tibia and fibula. Tibia and, and fibula, which is only three bones. Yeah. And if you think about... They make up a massive m- amount of space. A huge amount they? of space, completely. So... You know, when you're talking about 206 bones, there's lots of small bones that uh, are obviously in your hands and feet, but we don't need to know. We need to know at level two, 
globally the major bones of the body and then a few more bones at, at level three. Yes, yeah, exactly. And as part of knowing all of those bones and the sort of structure of them, the detail that the bone actually has and like the way it's positioned in a certain way to create the joint is insane how much that allows us to move. Like absolutely insane. So like the position, let's take just that, that you had the femur with the tibia and the fibula. When you look at them and you're like, The oh, architecture wow. and how they is articulate yeah. is 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 so, how did we get to that I, I, I don't even have a word for it it's i think we're going into a whole philosophical realm e evolution of, yeah <laughs> <laughs> different podcast um but bones are made of connective tissue which is reinforced with calcium uh, and specialized bone cells and then most bones also contain bone marrow where blood cells are made cool. uh, i don't think many people will link blood cells to bones um, but definitely need to know that as part of the function of the skeletal system. More so level three, I'd say. Yes, and the skeletal system part, um, the str knowing that at uh, level two as well. Okay, cool. Um, keep going. You seem like you're on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm liking it. Um, like Neil was saying earlier, if you take your, your leg, um, so you've got your femur, your tibia, your fibula, they all work with muscles and joints to hold the body together, allow us to support, create movement. Um, and that's called as a whole musculoskeletal system yeah. so you've got the muscle bit <laughs> the muscle bit and the skeletal bit and they're joined together with an o cool um so musculoskeletal when you see that that means muscles and bones and joints all working so together. the muscle o skeletal yeah wicked oh. <laughs> <laughs> um which is you know we actually talked about this yesterday didn't we about the the, the, the o is added into yeah. um joints yeah that's why I there we it. go. Yeah. So you take for one bone, the uh, another bone, and where they join, that creates that type of joint. Oh. There we go. <laughs> that might be, we might have just baffled you a little bit. That was our own little. <laughs> but what, what things what, we talk about? Things eh? we talk about. Yeah, we geek out over A and P all day long. Okay, so what we're talking about the musculoskeletal system. We're talking about the the bones meet and make a joint. Yeah. Okay, and then the muscle must cross a joint yes. in order to pull on another bone yep. to create joint actions. Yeah. There we go. So, for example, my quad yeah. goes over my knee and attaches down on my lower leg. It pulls on my lower leg and creates knee extension. Woo. There we go. That's amazing. When you can link it and apply it. So when you're learning bones, do exactly the same. Like have a good picture of bones. Um, up on your wall or wherever we actually had one learner that had a strip of old uh, wallpaper and yes. she got her like <laughs> six-year-old kid to uh, lay down on the wallpaper she drew around it, around her and then she literally labeled all the bones in the body and she got the Perfect. kids to join in which I thought was awesome and when you're doing that you can link it to actions link it to movement link it to things that you already know because it'll massively massively help um, so yeah, bones basically the the main function of the skeletal system, like we said, was shape, is structure, creating um, blood cells. Uh, so um, uh, and the other one we not mentioned is protection. Protection so, and storage of calcium. And storage of calcium. And so protection, we're talking about you're uh, protecting the heart and the lungs, major yeah. organs. The skull protects the brain. Yeah, we're well, uniquely designed. And attachment points, obviously. Yes, yeah, so cool. there's lots of um, uh, funky names, tubercles, and whatever tuberosities on certain parts of the bone which allow for attachment points of muscles so where the muscle um goes into the tendon and the tendon actually attaches to the bone so there's yeah. unique parts of every bone which actually pull on the on the muscle and the tendon bones, muscles, <laughs> tendons. yeah exactly i made I, it sound brainy and then i lost it i lost I, it I'm towards the end i'm going away because i've got that like funny bones song in my head like the oh. leg bone attaches to the so Haley wasn't actually <laughs> listening the whole way <laughs> Great, very well done, nice. So <laughs> let's just go down through some of the bones then. Um, obviously, I've just mentioned the, the skull, which includes the jaw as well. And protects the brain. And protects the brain. Then you've yep. got the spine. So you've got your cervical spine, sometimes referred to as C-spine, then the thoracic spine or T-spine, then lumbar, yep. lumbar spine or lumbar vertebra, which could be L-spine. And then you've got your sacrum and tailbone and coccyx. Yeah. Then we move down into the chest where you've got the ribs, uh, the breastbone, the sternum. Then we yep. can move up to the arms. We've got the shoulder blade, the scapula, the collarbone, the clavicle. Yeah. Then we move down into the arm. You've got the humerus, the radius, the ulna. Perfect. Then you've got the hands, 
where you go to the carpals, the metacarpals and the phalanges, Ooh, okay, which yeah. is quite a, a, line, a lot of people, uh, learners, get mixed up with the hands and feet. We're, we're, Ooh, we'll yeah. have those shortly. So hands and carpals. Then we go to the pelvis, so we come back into the, the main part of the body. So you've got your hip bones, you've got your ilium, your ischium and your pubis. And there's three bones each side. So you've got each of those on each side. On the left one on the and right, one right. On the right. So the ilium left, ischium left, pubis left. There we go. And obviously on the right. Then we come down into the legs where you've got your femur. Then you've got your kneecap or your patella. Yes, okay. get that one. And you've got your shin bone, which is your tibia and your fibula. And we come down into the feet where you've got your tarsals, metatarsals and phalanges. So when we compare the feet and the hands, you've got your carpals, your hands, your tarsals, your feet, your metacarpals in the hands, metatarsals in your feet. Yes. And then phalanges, hand, phalanges, on feet. Both yeah. There we go. Nice. That was a quick rundown. There we go. Like so you it. might want to press pause, rewind and go back through them. But we basically just covered the entire and body. For level it. two and level three, they're the ones you need to know. So label those. Get Make sure you're happy with all of those. But more specifically, I want to dive into the types of bones. Okay. Because yeah. I think this is for stumbling block, 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 block. block, block. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of learners go wrong. So we've got a, a number of different types of bones in the body. So it's not just a case of um, this is my... Uh, femur, my humerus, my ulna, radius, uh, <laughs> clicking <Wow>. joints, <laughs> okay, uh, my patella. But each one of these bones has it is a specific type of bone as well. So. And that's based on its function. There's five of them. So um, long bones, you're probably already aware of. These are the ones we were talking about, like the femurs and fibulas and tibias. These are really long and thin in shape. Um, they include things like on your arms and your legs. Um, with the help of muscles, long bones are really good as long levers to allow for movement. Wicked. And I think that's the key. They're long levers to create movement. There we go. So anybody yeah. watching on YouTube, Hayley was just doing some movement. <laughs> some movement, <laughs> which looked a little bit odd. But long bones are longer than they are wider. Definitely. And have a long shaft on them. And then there's the end of the bone. Yes wicked um for level two understanding the long bone is absolutely and key and of the it. structure of that we'll put um, a link with this was a actually. great blog that we we wrote a few months back actually yeah then we move down to short bones yeah now these are kind of like square in shape they're cubed so they uh, examples of these are your carpals and your tarsals you know neil was saying about the the carpals in the hand tarsals in the feet carpals are like these little squares in the base of the hand um, so they're the short bones, much different in shape and um, and function, really. Yeah, so in your feet, that'd be like your cuneiforms, your navicular, and your cuboid. A cuboid is for square. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's got its name in it. Fantastic. Um, and at level three, understanding a little bit more about these short bones and where they are and located is going to be key. Yep, yeah. and what they're there for. And what they're there for. Let's look at flat bones. Flat bones are flat, believe it or not. They're not. <laughs> they are. <laughs> so a nice broad surface, a nice flat, broad surface. So an Usually example, for a lot of attachments. Yeah, so an example would be? Uh, so you've got the shoulder blades, so the scapula. You've got your ribs, which are flat. You've got your sternum and also the bones that make up your skull. Wicked. I like it. So... We're talking about something that's flat. I think the scapula is certainly something that, well, all of the bones, but the scapula going forwards beyond the exam is something that you really must know more and more about. And the more you learn about muscle attachments, you realise just how important it is. It's a big flat shape that has all these different attachments on it. There's so much on the scapula. It's, it's unreal. unreal. We were, maybe we do a podcast just on the scapula at some point. Um, yeah. But understanding the muscles that attach around the so that'd be our origin and insertion around the scapula and their function is going to be key not for your exam well it is for your exam but more so for your clients after and your knowledge because yes. what whenever a client or you move your shoulder in any direction and we know that it has a great range of movement your scapula is involved to some degree yeah there wow. we go and if you're doing anything that involves the arms your scapula, this flat bone, is engaged to some degree. So if you don't know what's going on around the scapula, then you don't, I'm going to be really, really harsh here, you don't have the license <laughs> <laughs> to be doing any upper body exercise. Which is basically everything. Which is basically everything. <laughs> everything upper body. Sorry. Everything yeah. upper body. Well, cool. to be honest, even when you're holding 
There we go. Yeah. Uh, irregular bones is the next one. So irregular These bones. A great. Who's going to do it? Me or you? You can do it. You can do it. I love the definition of this. Well, go for it. Over to you then. It's basically anything that doesn't fit into the ones above. <laughs> I didn't. Um, the um, shape doesn't conform <laughs> to any particular it's shape. It's not long, it's not short, it's not flat, it's, it's just a bit weird. It's just a little bit irregular. So a really good example of this is the spine. So the, the, the lumbar vertebra, thoracic vertebra, the um, cervical vertebra, they're an odd shape, they're yeah. an irregular shape. Um, if I took the lumbar one, L1, and compared that to C1, cervical one, even though they're both in the spine and they look kind of similar, they're not the same shape. So different. Yeah. Super, super different. Even if I took T1 and T12 in the thoracic, they would look similar, but they are not. Yeah. The shape of the spinous process, the transverse process, the angle of them, they are very, very different. Awesome. And that's what makes it irregular. Perfect. Nice one. Next one down. Last one. Number five is sesamoid. Sesamoid. So sesamoid bone is really different because it's really small usually, which is where the name comes from. So sesamoid is from uh, like the Latin of sesame seed. Uh, there's your trivia. Now I've got, there's my trivia. Now I've got Sesame Street in my head. <laughs> no, sesame seed. Oh. Um, <laughs> and it's basically embedded within a tendon. So the patella is the best example, but you've also got them in your hands and your feet. And it's, right inside a tendon so you've got a tendon either side of it. it's almost like a floating bone it floats yeah. in tendon what i love about this just picture this for a second look at your left or right quad okay so you've got your the bone in there is your femur and then at your knee your tibia and fibula articulate with the femur and create a hinge joint yeah. and your quad muscles your four quad muscles go over the knee and they create knee extension now if you took away the sesamoid bone this is i love this i'm geeking out now if i took away the sesamoid bone your patella your kneecap and it still had the same insertion which okay. is just on the top of the tibia yeah on the um tibial, tibial, tibial tuberosity okay which is the knobbly bit in the front of your uh shin so you can feel very when top. you kneel down yeah yeah okay so if i took away that sesamoid bone the patella my quad would not be able to create Ooh. knee extension. Ah. The moment the sesamoid bone or the kneecap patella is in, well, obviously in, it's always there, it's been <laughs> there, evolution, another topic, <laughs> okay? Because that is there, that creates enough lever, enough purchase to actually bring about knee extension. Oh, wow. That's how important bones are. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. So if you think about a lot of clients are going to turn up with, you know, certainly let's say 30 plus, but it could be happen at any age, various sports, lifestyle um, accidents happen. They could turn up with a whole host of knee damage, knee injuries, um, various meniscal uh, cartilage issues going on could it aggravate and upset the patella. Mm. That's why I need to understand the structure and function of bones and muscles crossing the joint. Yeah. Because very simply, if there's something going on in the knee, okay, I'm not going to be able to create knee extension or flexion easily. Okay, another 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 podcast that I was proper geeking out. But yeah, the I sesamoid bone. There we go. So let's move on. Should we find out what's actually going on <laughs> on these bones? Let's go what's, what's um, going on. So, so go for it. All the bones also have these sort of certain uh functions or features, I should say, of each of the bones. So first of all, let's start on the outside. We'll start with periosteum. Periosteum, just so that you know when you're breaking down the word, when you see it, you've got peri and then you've got osteo, osteum. So O-S-T-E, -E, when you see that, O-S-T relates to bone. So it's talking about bone. Don't confuse it with perimysium that's in the muscle, which is that's M-Y. That's a great point. From an exam perspective, yeah. the amount of learning. Because <laughs> in the exam, you're going to get four options. And there's going to be like two really close and then kind of one a little bit further away and then like a red herring. But one a little bit further away to add confusion. Is Could be really similar, like periosteum, perimysium. Perimysium. So it's a word that is the, the spelling of that word, which is throwing you off. Mm. And that's the kind of a red herring here. The so confusion. if you're looking for bones, look for osteo. If you look, yeah, completely. Right. 
Um, so is this periosteum is a dense, tough outer shell. So imagine like a shell on an egg, if you like. Um, that's basically really tough outer shell and it contains all the blood vessels and all the nerves, which we need. There we go. Um, so there's a blood supply to the- Then we come um, down from periosteum to- uh, Underneath you've got a compact, dense tissue. So this is the hard, smooth layer that protects the tissue cool. inside the bone. Then Next that goes down. down into spongy or cancellous bone. It's also called, which is porous and it's honeycombed. Um, I love honeycomb. I know. Bring Honey it crunchy. Or crun no, I'm thinking honeycomb ice cream. How are you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, We're recording this at nine in the morning, and I'm thinking we've had Sesame Street, you've had um, Funny Bone Funny song. Bone Song, and now uh, I'm ju I just want honeycomb ice cream. <laughs> uh, and this is found inside most bones uh, so this spongy cancellous tissue uh, which allows the bone to be strong but really importantly lightweight because if we had that compact stuff the whole way through it like it would be so heavy <laughs> <laughs> we're dragging ourselves around completely so it, it's it, it allows for the bone to be fully functional yet spongy, spongy and efficient <laughs> and lightweight to move yes Cool. And then finally, right in the middle, we've got bone marrow. Um, and this is jelly-like jelly substance, which is found inside mm, the cavity. Jelly. <laughs> <laughs> jelly and ice cream. <laughs> oh, you've sorted out your bones. I have. Knowledge. <laughs> uh, inside the cavities of some bones. Uh, not all bones. Um, and the, they produce blood cells. So this is where the blood cells are produced inside the bone marrow, which is the very inside cavity. I think we take it for granted, like about about the bones. Mm. I think during our learning for the exam, but even be like, but beyond that, we don't really consider actually what what's going on in the bones, and they have three Just or four. Just assume they'll yeah, always be there. <laughs> three or four major roles of the body. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Right. Should we have a look? at uh, a little bit more detail on bone cells do you want bone to? cells so we've obviously just touched on bone tissue which makes up the bones you had your periosteum your compact or dense tissue number two then we went spongy or cancerous bone uh, right into bone marrow so it's kind of the four uh, main points for bone tissue now let's jump into bone cells um, and your body's constantly remodeling and making up and building bone cells. I find this amazing because... You are not the same skeleton as you were when you but were... But it looks the same, <laughs> even when I stopped growing. Do you know what I mean? Like, it looks the same. The bone's still in the same place, but it's constantly remodeling, breaking down, building back up. So it's a kind of a fun trivia fact, pub quiz. Yes. Uh, each bone is rebuilt from scratch about every 10 years. Ooh. Okay, so... Um, 40 of them, then. Four of them. Oh, not 40 oh. of them. Four of them. Oh. <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> That's mean. But, but what we're really talking about here is osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Yes. Okay, so osteoblasts build bone and osteoclasts break down bone. Or collapse. Or collapse. So the way I remember it is osteoblasts, blasts starts with a B, therefore it builds. And osteoclasts, class starts with a C, and that's collapse. Collapse. So build blasts, collapse, class. Class. <laughs> that's really hard to say. <laughs> it's quite, but I'm, I, it, it, it massively helps a lot of learners when it comes to what the blasts do and what the clasts do. And as we get older, we obviously have less of the osteoblast taking place, whereby we rebuild the bone. So yes, yeah, so, and more so during during your younger years and then through through puberty, you're in biased or favour of osteoblasts. And as you go past puberty and into older adult life you then become in favor of osteoclasts it's all breaking down so it's all breaking down but that's what we're going to talk about very shortly of why uh, training smart and training effectively is so important to kind of tip the balance back into osteoblasts and get some more bone density yeah completely. amazing there's one more cell just to mention which is called an osteocyte um it's about c-y-t-e so osteocyte um, the cell, and these are the cells that maintain bone tissue by controlling the amount of mineral and calcium content. Cool. So um, obviously calcium is stored in the bone tissue itself. So the bone is the calcium. So if more calcium is needed in the body, it can be leached out of the bones by breaking them down. Remember that clasts collapse bone. Um, and the osteocytes are the ones that control that mineral and calcium level. So as a, a population of people, that um, 
would would be leaching more calcium out of bones would be a postmenopausal lady. Oh, yes. Which is why we see um, osteoporosis more prevalent in uh, a female postmenopause. Yes. Where we're leaching calcium out of bones based on a hormonal imbalance. Yeah. Ooh. Wow. There we go. Some nuggets of info in this. Uh, final couple of things then, which links into kind of a principles and kind of what I just said around um, uh, different age groups and those that are prevalent of different bone, um, density. bone densities is, is that topic of bone density and why it's important to, uh, what can we do as messages to clients and ourselves, but what can we do to improve bone density and prevent uh, various common clinical conditions I such as osteoporosis. Thing is once your bone density drops you're much more likely to have a fracture. You're much more likely yep. to, if you fall, to break a wrist, to break a hip, break a spine. Um, break a spine. <laughs> break your spine. Um, there's the three common sites for yep. fractures for following falls. So yep. sp um, spine, wrist, and hip. And those are the, the, the places that are going to be more prevalent to osteoporosis, those particular areas, so spine, wrist, and hip. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, that they're more oh. likely to fracture based on the falls because yes. of those positioning. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you're more likely to fracture those areas, um, <clears throat> which can be really debilitating. So just take the wrist, for example. That's going to mean that you maybe don't want to go out for a walk in case you fall again and hurt your wrist. So fear avoidance. Yeah, but yeah. also things like writing, typing, could make a massive difference and mean that you're Day at work. Daily life. Just, yeah. just Picking things up. Yeah, completely. It's Opening crazy. Opening a jar. Um, for your spine, that obviously has massive implications on how that might affect spinal nerves and pain later on. Mobility. The, the, the research around just the, uh, a spine fracture and the clinical conditions or cascade of that uh, go, you know thereafter is huge it's actually yeah. for, well all bones are bad to break but that's probably i'm going to say the worst one <laughs> yeah but also with hip fractures if that then equals a hip replacement or a joint replacement that can then um is really closely linked to early death based on the implications wow. that come from a, a hip replacement well, that escalated quickly sorry <laughs> But it's true, and that's something we cover in the exercise referral course and low back pain level four. So if your client isn't understanding why you want them to make certain changes lifestyle-wise, then giving that Scare leverage, them to death. <laughs> scare them. Um, Didn't see it going down that route. <laughs> then that leverage can work really well. Well, and, it's very harsh, but I think there's other things we can be doing for a prior to scaring them to death. <laughs> okay. So, um, we want to talk about um, diet. I think diet's so key, not just from like a dietary source of calcium, but what you put in your body affects the entire system. Yeah. Fact. Yeah. Fact. There Everywhere we go. in the body. So encouraging um, small dietary changes on a weekly or monthly basis is only going to add up to uh, better health. And one of the first places that's going to affect is the skeletal system. And sort of green leafy veg are really good for dietary calcium. Um, and also avoiding things like fizzy drinks, which can have a negative effect on calcium, apparently. There we go. Um, Adequate vitamin D. Get outside. Sunshine. Sunshine. We're off on, uh, on holly bobs. Oh, I hate that <laughs> She hates that word. Uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so we're going to get some nice vit vitamin D for, for a few days. But food, I think that's the key, again, of getting vitamin D. So various foods... Um, are, in, are enriched with vitamin D, which yeah. improves the quality and density of a bone. Yeah, and the more balanced the diet is, the more all the other vitamins and minerals you're going to have as well, which will help regardless. Completely. I think the final point I want to highlight really is this kind of weight-bearing effect on bones. Mm. So that could just be for um, for anyone. It could, the simplest one is walking. Just walk more. Get your knee up. Non-exercise <laughs> activity, uh, thermogenesis. Just get outside. Get moving. The and the active, weight of your body. The weight of the body just is enough um, to encourage the body to build bone density. So it doesn't have to be that you've got dumbbells in order to make it no, weight No, not bearing. at all. You're just holding your body weight. Yeah, completely. So if you look at um, older populations that are um, more exposed and prevalent, and we see the numbers go up in terms of osteoporosis and other osteo clinical conditions, you can see that aligns with uh, uh, inactivity. Or the exercise they do is gentle on the joints, like say swimming or aquarobics or something whereby, or a seated exercise like cycling, so, whereby you're not weight bearing anymore. So something you know I've, I've been looking at is optimal overload, mm. OL, 
No, optimal overload. Two O's. Oh, oh. oh, oh. <laughs> I don't know where oh. I got the L from. Um, I think it's just load. So optimal load. That's what I've been looking at. Yeah, corrected optimal myself. Optimal loading. Optimal loading. There we go. <laughs> or optimal overloading. But we're looking at optimal load. And what I mean by that is that could just be walking. That could be... Um, that could still be non-weight bearing like cycling. There's still force going through some key joints, but it's loading joints, loading the bones enough to bring about a physiological response to encourage bone density. Yes. There we go. Awesome. And with that, all the resistance exercises as well, can't be har- like they will not harm <laughs> in doing resistance exercises in an optimal loading pattern to Completely. make sure that your client is moving safely, but also building up those um, osteo so you want to be you know overloading the muscle which overloads the tendon which pulls on the bone and then that stresses the bone stresses that then stresses the bone and then that means more building that stresses the joint which stresses the ligaments which stresses other tendons which stresses other muscles which pulls on other bones it's one big cascade effect the cascade effect there we go so i think the key here is Going back to right the very, very beginning, uh, I'm just going to scroll up through my notes. The exact thing that we, that we said was fit pros often see the skeletal system as something they need to know just for the anatomy exam. Yeah. This means as soon as the exam is over and that short-term memory no longer needs that information, poof, all so that gone. information is gone. And, you know, I, we've said it, this is episode 28, so we've said it at least 27 times. And probably a few times in each one. <laughs> okay. But why anatomy is important and understanding these topics for the eight modules that make up your anatomy exam is, is more for post exam than the exam. Yes. So if you're sitting there uh, struggling um, and you found today's um, podcast valuable interesting useful and you know you find yourself going back through the anatomy pod uh, fit pro sessions to scrape information i just want to invite you to the revision boot camps yeah because inside there it's it's all organized it's all structured it's in one place and it allows you to learn everything straight up and if you like this uh learning by audio like listening to us on podcasts etc like now then on there's an opportunity to do that with each of the videos and tutorials yeah you can bootcamp. download to mp3 mp4 what the the, the revision boot camp is not it's not me and Haley chatting away and having a giggle about honeycomb ice cream <laughs> no okay it is just Haley um talking you through teaching you as if you're in the classroom um one-on-one that's the beauty of it yeah okay exactly. Um, you can have the uh, the entertainment from a podcast, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the other things in, inside there, it's not just not just the actual tutorials. What I love about it is you've got the um, instant passing hacks, which allows you to break down exam style questions and have a you know a, a very simple like system. Like we were talking about periosteums and uh, perimyceums, it's breaking it's down bra- the exam you know, show, we, t- we show you how to break down the exam question. You've got instant uh, l- learning secrets, yeah. um, which shows you and tells you how to learn best yeah. for you. Um, and then you've got like the four week revision planner. If your exam is in the next four weeks, you've got an eight week revision planner and a weekly revision schedule. So we've kind of just got you six and a load of mock questions and a load of unseen and mock questions sheets. and some cheat sheets. So, but the beauty of it is, I know this is kind of a big shameful plug now. Uh, unapologetic I just love it because it allows it's allowed so many learners to go from a to b and kind of go I get it I need it for the exam but here it is sitting in my long-term memory and I know it and I know it and there's acronyms metaphors um easy ways of stories, learning stories diagrams. so that you could be you know we've you know still in contact with learners three four five six years ago and they're all you know talking about the the flow of air and the acronym you have for the flow of air. Mary and Larry. There we go. <laughs> and which means it's sitting in their long-term memory, which means they're impacting clients and getting really, really strong results yeah. because of their underpinning a and knowledge. Bam. There you go. So that said, I would like to also invite you to, uh, if you've enjoyed this podcast and all the others, make sure that you've hit a review on iTunes or yep. the relevant uh, platform that Let you're the on. Let the world know we mean business yep. from Sub- A&P. <laughs> subscribe to us on YouTube as well. Hit like and leave a little comment below on what was your, your favorite bit of from this podcast. I would love to know that actually. On YouTube, leave us a little comment below. What was your favorite takeaway message from this whole podcast? Yeah, and there's links below for, yeah, completely. Of the um, 
various songs that have come into our heads. Anyway, uh, there's also links below for our Parallel Coaching Inner Circle Facebook group. Yeah. There's perfect. a thousand plus, 1200 plus people in there now, people just like you, yeah. who want to learn and absolutely ace becoming a fit pro. So with that okay. said, we will see you on episode number 29. See you later. Bye. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman. And I'm Hayley Bergman. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands of fitness professionals to get qualified, learn with simplicity, and coach clients with confidence. We're the first to say that learning and being a fit pro doesn't have to be hard work, and that with the right structure, support, and resources, you can become a confident and knowledgeable fitness professional that is dedicated to more. So how do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching.